So focusing on adverse effects, um, different TKI based therapies and different TKI targets will have different side effect profiles. And when there's multiple drugs that might target something, so for example, target VEGF or target ELK, across the board with all the different drugs, there can be a similar side effect profile, which one, like as a pharmacist with many of these drugs, helps me navigate and understand that the backbone of treatment can have these different effects. Of course, specific drugs can have specific side effects that are only you know, related to that drug. But the picture like this kind of helps to hone in on, oh yeah, I have an ELK inhibitor and here are the most common class-based side effects. So throughout the solid, um, the solid tumor oral cancer therapy section, I have taken some of the disease states and some of the more common drugs that you might see and done just a little review of them. So the first disease state is melanoma with the BRAF and MEK inhibitors. Not saying that those therapies can't be used in other, um, other indications, but the first ones was for melanoma. As you can see in this pathway picture here, if a patient's tumor tests positive, or not positive, <laughs> if it's mutated BRAF, um, this patient can qualify for a BRAF and a MEK inhibitor. So we have three different sets of drugs for this, dibrafenib and trametinib, venurafenib and cobimetinib, and encorafenib and binimetinib. I'm mean, gonna be quite honest, we do not use a lot of them cobi. We either use dibrafenib, trametinib, or encorafenib and binimetinib. It's just based on toxicity profiles um, and tolerability. Additionally, in melanoma, if it's gonna be used in an adjuvant setting, dibrafenib and trametinib, um, or, um, is, the one, is the only combination that's indicated for that. I've created lots of charts in this presentation for you guys to be able to reference later with which has the different capsules and tablet sizes. Um, <clears throat> and that can help dictate, especially if you, if you have dose reductions, what to do with it. A lot of these therapies just across the board have drug drug interaction concerns. In your clinic pharmacist, if it's um, if you're starting somebody on these therapies in outpatient setting, will make sure that there is no drug drug interactions or anything that we have to do because of those drug drug interactions. As you can imagine, all of these have some sort of administration concerns. Dibrafenib and trametinib can be hard for patients because it is and has to be taken on an empty stomach. There's something about that that can really throw a wrench in a patient's day. And so kind of what I'll do is a pharmacist map out with the patient, well, what time do you normally eat and what time can we incorporate this into your normal day? And carapinib and binimetinib um, appears to be our first treatment option for um, metastatic setting. Um, Dr. Albertini, I'll be curious what Dr. Ma thinks. Appear, we kind of like this one out of the gate because it appears to be the best tolerated, but of course, again, side effects can happen with any of these. In regards to those side effects, the BRAF inhibitors, um, again, venurafenib, it, it was the first guy on the market and um, he, he can cause lots of issues, fatigue, rashes, lots of arthralgias can happen. Dibrafenib then was after that, um, a little bit better tolerated, but it can cause um, drug fevers, which is something that a lot of patients might not be ready for. Like you try to explain that to them that they need to monitor for fevers, it might be drug related. Um, and then encorafenib, the last guy on the market, can cause more peripheral neuropathies, um, increases in serum creatinine and um, CK, so that one has different monitoring recommendations um, associated with it. MEK inhibitors, so trametinib, across the board, trametinib, cobimetinib, and binimetinib can all cause edema, edema, rashes, and um, increases in AST and ALT. You can see cobimetinib, again, why well, we don't really love this drug. Um, we don't really love this drug just because of some of these side effects. Um, but then binimetinib, latest guy in the market, still can cause some lab abnormalities, but again, appears to be better tolerated um, compared to cobimetinib. There is a question that venurafenib is associated with squamous cell. Technically, they all can if a BRAF inhibitor is used by itself without the MEK inhibitor. Um, but venurafenib, because it was the first guy in the market, very interestingly, the timeline of it, venurafenib came on the market, 
we used a lot of it. We saw a lot of this um, squamous cell carcinoma. And then dabrafenib and trametinib. So a combination came out and the risk of squamous cell carcinoma decreases tremendously. But again, it, it can happen if you use a BRAF inhibitor all by itself. Melanoma patient case. Um, so MJ is a 39 year old stage 3B resected melanoma. She began adjuvant therapy. We in clinic, um, and I believe this is explained in a different um, fellows lecture later. As pharmacists, we follow up with these patients to make sure that they're taking things appropriately and monitoring for side effects. She informs me that she's only been taking one capsule of dabrafenib twice daily. So if you look at here, our prescriptions, there, it, a lot of these have a really large pill burden associated with them. And a lot of patients don't think of taking two at once, twice a day. That's a, it's a different scenario compared to what they're used to, especially in a 39 year old who may not have taken any drugs prior to this. And so she wasn't taking things correctly. Thankfully, we identified it one week into it. And then she, of course, started um, taking the correct dosing. The same patient, she's brought back in the clinic five months after starting therapy, and she has a itchy, bumpy red rash on her torso, face, legs, and upper arms. It's approximately covering 90% of her body. Why she didn't call in, she, she was like, well, I felt like I'd been in the sun a little bit, and so I felt like it might have been a heat rash this summer. What would be our treatment options? And there can be more than one answer. So hold therapy, start prednisone, and taper over four weeks. Start hydroxyzine, and then apply hydrocortisone cream. So yeah, you're definitely going to start hydrocortisone cream. You are definitely going to hold therapy. Thank you. It's covering 90% of her body. Um, you can also do hydroxyzine um, as needed for any itching. The one thing with option B is a little trick that I put in here. So you can do steroids, but usually with um, an oral TKI based rash, you don't have to taper over four weeks. That's more of like an immune related adverse effect. So you can do steroids, but usually it's like a couple days, so five or seven days, for example. So her rash resolved, she presents back to clinic. We reduce her dose. One week after starting, she calls in to report she has fevers. So which medication is the likely culprit? Dibrafenib, trametinib, or postprednisone fevers? Yes, A, dibrafenib is the right answer. Dibrafenib, so if you get a call at 9.30 when you guys are on call and you look at the med list and you see dibrafenib and it's fevers and they've called in previously, it's probably still dibrafenib related fevers. Unfortunately, when we try to treat through, but sometimes do need to uh, dose reduce. Okay, so let's shift gears into lung cancer. So we have um, uh, two classes we're gonna cover today, EGFR inhibitors and ELK inhibitors. So lung has five different FDA approved EGFR inhibitors. In the NCCN guidelines, it clearly states which ones um, are preferred out of the gate for a patient with an EGFR mutation. As you can see, all have different varying ways of that they need to take it. All have different drug drug interactions um, and different tablet sizes and what dose adjustments might be necessary for toxicity. So, as you can see across the board, we have a lot of dermatologic, GI, and then more rare pulmonary um, or ocular issues with these drugs. Um, I kind of mentioned some of these side effects, but big things for pictures with any EGF um, R inhibitors, rashes, we'll talk about rashes in the next slide, diarrhea, eye issues um, can be a big thing. And then there's just some more like rare side effects with the pulmonary, so a pneumonitis risk and ocular concerns. Let's talk about EGFR inhibitor rashes. So we have oral agents that target EGFR. There is also IV agents, and we are not covering those IV agents. So that's like panitumumab or cetuximab. 
Oral EGFR inhibitors, though, in addition to those IV therapies, they all can cause the characteristic acne form rash. So it looks like acne, but it is not acne, and it should not be treated like acne. Um, very interestingly, those rashes, and when you're like, I'm educating a patient, they, they need to keep it as well moisturized as possible because um, dryness and UV radiation can actually make the rash significantly worse. Here's what to do based on the severity of the EGFR inhibitor rash. With oral agents, we don't start anything up front in a preventative manner. Everything is reactive just because the acne form rash appears to be less common versus from um, the IV therapy, such as um, cetuximab and panitumumab. Topical steroids are used. Um, in uh, more severe cases, you're gonna see oral doxycycline used, um, and that can be continued for weeks or months. Acne form rashes, it's also really important for, for patients to note that it can wax and wane over time. And so they might start a therapy, it gets worse and they get a flare up, especially in their T zone on their face, it gets better. And then it comes back five or six weeks later. And it's just the nature of the beast of an acne form rash. So let's do our patient case. PV is a 49 year old woman with recurrent metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, GFR positive. She was started on a fatinib. So we called her two weeks later um, for adherence and toxicity. And the following note was made. So she has many areas of rash across her body. They feel dry. She's not putting any lotions or creams. Patient's husband states her eyes are more red. They feel more dry, um, but she doesn't have any vision or changes her sensitivity to light. She reports that she has diarrhea, six to seven episodes of diarrhea throughout the day. Um, but it doesn't feel like it's, or doesn't seem like it's that bad. And then she has some muscle, um, stiff muscle after taking doses um, that can sometimes make her feel like she needs to use something, but she has actually not used anything for it. In this side effect profile, you can definitely see that the patient was turned on EGFR inhibitor based on her symptoms. So which of the below answers are potential supportive care options? So for rash, continue taking the doxycycline and start using hydrocortisone cream. The eye dryness and redness, start using artificial tears. Diarrhea, start over-the-counter loperamide. And then mouth sores, um, start a biotin product. Oh, I forgot to mention she has mouth sores. And her warm salt water baking soda rinses. Or E, all of the above. Yes, E is the correct answer, all of the above. So yeah, she has to start a lot of different supportive care medications. Nothing that warrants a dose reduction yet in her fatinib, but um, she needs to be more aggressive with her management of her adverse effects. So moving into the ELK inhibitors, there's also five of these available. Um, looking here at the, the top of the list, you have crizotinib, seritinib, electinib, brigatinib, and lorlatinib. Uh, dosing is listed from all of these. Some are once a day, some are twice a day. The once daily ones, of course, can be more, um, can have better adherence for patients. Administration is listed, drug, drug interactions. Dose adjustments for toxicities, kind of a different toxicity profile. So things that you gotta look at is, you know, cardiovascular risks, monitoring CPK, there can be a pulmonary toxicity risk. And if you look here on this side effect chart, we list some of those out in more detail. Um, some have visual disturbances associated with them. Some can cause hyperglycemia issues. So in a patient that might be either pre-diabetic or have diabetes, they need to know this ahead of time because their um, levels are probably gonna go a little out of whack until, um, until they can stabilize or get better control of their sugars. Most often we have to adjust their um, home medications. No patient case with that one. Moving into breast cancer, which I think will be the last thing that I cover. Um, in breast cancer, there is a lot of different oral um, therapy options. I focus on the CDK4-6 inhibitors because they are one of the more common ones that we use or that you might encounter. So there's three drugs on the market, um, palbociclib, ribociclib, and abmociclib. Um, palbo and ribo are both cycle-based, so this is one where a patient's 
They take them both from days 1 through 21, and then they're off for a week. The nice part about abacyclib is it's actually continuous dosing, which can be a lot easier for patients. Listed here is how to take it. We're not a big ribocyclib institution just because there's more cardiovascular concerns with that one. You're going to see more palbo or abacyclib used in clinic. Side effects, so palbo and ribo, the dose limiting toxicity of that one is going to be neutropenia and it can be pro profound and it can be significant. So the laboratory monitoring that's built and recommended, you need to follow it. Abmacyclib, the dose limiting toxicity with this one is diarrhea. So although this one can still cause count issues, most commonly it's gonna cause some diarrhea issues for your patients. Special consideration, the one part about abacyclib where you might see it used up front is in a patient maybe that has metastatic disease in their brain because it, we do know that one crosses the blood-brain barrier. So let's do this last patient case and then we'll wrap up. So ML is a 78-year-old female with metastatic ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer diagnosed in 2019. She started on palbo and letrozole. And so I pulled from the package insert for palbo, which you do if a patient has um, hematologic toxicities. So the really nice part too is they actually list you out um, the grades of what their A and C is and what you should do. So her cycle one day 15 labs reveal the following. So an A and C of 400. What grade of neutropenia is she experiencing and what is the most appropriate action for ML's palbo cyclib? So grade three, continue palbo. Grade three, hold palbo. Grade four, continue palbo. Or grade uh, D, grade four, hold palbo. Decrease dose. Oh, Matt. So her ANC is 400, so it definitely puts her at grade four. So the answer is either C or D. <clears throat> yeah, D is the correct answer. So if you see a patient's ANC come back as 400, you need to hold palbo at that time. And then you have to let it recover until it's less than or equal to grade two, and you're going to decrease the dose at that time. So that's what we did. Um, she resumed at 100 milligrams daily. She returned for cycle two, day 15 labs, and wah, wah, her ANC is now 250. Um, and this is an act, all of my patient cases are actual patient cases. So at that time, we, of course, held her palbo and let it, her ANC recover, and then we dose reduced to 75. At that point, we uh, returned for cycle three, day 15 labs. Her ANC was still 450. And so at that time, after three attempts um, with dose reductions, her palbo was permanently discontinued, and we discussed other CDK4-6 inhibitors. So what's really lovely, this was way back in 2020, um, we did abacyclib for her because there was a decreased risk of neutropenia. We did have concerns about diarrhea. Thankfully, though, um, she is doing wonderfully on the abacyclib 100 twice a day. She required like an initial dose reduction, but really um, this is her like sweet spot and she remains on therapy to this day, which is really, really awesome. It was a rocky road to begin with, but um, she appears to be still or she still is doing well. So with that, I'll take any questions last Monday, folks, just to finish our oral drug section. Um, we finished last time with a breast cancer case with the CDK4-6 inhibitors. Um, there's absolutely a lot more other drugs that can be used in breast cancer, but um, those are some of the big ones that you're going to see. There's other less common options that you might see used, such as Everlimus and Alpha-Lessa, but uh, in the interest of time, we're moving on to a different disease state. So prostate cancer also has a lot of drugs associated with it. Today, we're going to focus on two that are a little more commonly used, and that's abiraterone and enzalutamide. Oh, there we go. 
So the dosing is listed here on the, on the side as um, a note. Some of these come as different tablet sizes. So something, if you think of the prostate cancer population, they're a little bit older and need a little bit more reinforcement sometimes to make sure that they're taking the correct amount of tablets or capsules to equal both of these doses. Abiraterone is used in combination with prednisone and zalutamide is by itself. Administration is listed here. Again, sometimes that empty stomach can really um, uh, set up patients for confusion, especially when they might have a solid regimen at home that they know they take all their breakfast meds and all their dinner meds, for example. There are drug-drug interactions, so be aware of those. Usually your clinic pharmacist is going to be looking for those interactions. And then the um, indications are listed there. <clears throat> Adverse effects. When I think of abiraterone, I think of the fatigue risk, sometimes arthralgia risk over time, blood pressure issues and edema that come, can come along with um, how it affects the steroid levels in the body. Special considerations for that drug includes dose reducing for moderate hepatic impairment, so of course checking into that, and then monitoring for mineral cortico excess um, just because of how the drug works <clears throat> with the steroids. Enzalutamide, the biggest side effect, or almost like the dose limiting toxicity for enzalutamide is the fatigue that it can happen. Patients will noticeably, um, if they're going to have this, will see a difference within about two to four weeks after starting. There was a seizure risk reported in the original clinical trials, so that is something to be um, considered, or something you should consider if you're starting this, if the patient does have a history of seizures. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can't use the drug, but should be something that is talked about with the patient. Renal cell TKIs, I would say in the past, like five to seven years, the amount of changes with how we treat renal cell um, has increased significantly. Listed here on the slide are some of the TKIs that we can use in renal cell. Um, I gotta move some of these screens because I can't even see all my drugs. So pisopinib, cabozantinib, sunitinib, linvatinib, and the last guy, excitinib. Most often, um, out of the gate, you might be combining this with some immunotherapy. We'll talk about that uh, moving forward. But here are five TKIs that do have indications for renal cell. The dosing is listed, how it should be administered. Again, all of these are just slightly different. Um, most appear to be substrates of CYP3A4, so be considerate of that in terms of drug-drug interactions. And additionally, how they're supplied changes, you have multiple different tablet sizes and capsule sizes. The biggest thing to call out um, in terms of these drugs when I think about them, sunitinib, very interestingly, you might see a change in how that is dosed. So they, you know, the FDA labeled indication is taking it four weeks of a six week cycle. But sometimes you'll see that change where they'll do two weeks on and one week off. Sometimes that allows the patient to have more of a break. Excitinib is a drug that is recommended to be escalated. Um, you start at a low dose and you escalate the dose based on how the patient tolerates it. So side effects are listed here. They're very, you know, just because they have, most of these affect VEGF in some way, shape, or form, a lot of these TKIs have very similar class side effects. So I always think of watching for blood pressure, diarrhea, the hand, foot, skin reaction, or other rashes, fatigue, things that across the spectrum all of these TKIs can cause. There's other things if you think of affecting VEGF. Um, bleeding and clot risks, that kind of varies based on the drug. Now, in the past couple years, um, in addition to these oral drugs, <clears throat> we now combine the oral drugs, the TKIs, with immune checkpoint inhibitors. So, for example, in renal cell, you have different indications now. You have Pembro plus excitinib, cabozantinib plus nivolumab, um, and then a valumab plus excitinib in addition to pembrolin and lumbatinib. Um, that one is also indicated for endometrial cancer. And I do know that that's an active study here um, is combining pembrolizumab plus lumbatinib. So sometimes it can be very hard if you're thinking of side effect profiles to tease out what's causing what. Um, but you know, that's 
medicine and it's something where we if you kind of know the side effect profiles you can help hone in on if something is causing it versus others for example if you're having blood pressure is issues is most likely the tki rashes well that can be a little bit more up, up for debate i would also um, in terms of that sort of side effect you got to look at the timeline so if it's in the first couple of weeks i'm in a more happy brain a tki versus if it's after two or three cycles of the immune checkpoint inhibitor that's when I would see potentially the immune checkpoint or blame the immune checkpoint inhibitor for that. Okay, and then finally for our gynecologic population, um, using PARP inhibitors has definitely become more um, prevalent, I would say in the past couple years. There's three different <clears throat> PARP inhibitors available, Olaparib, Caparib, and Neraparib. The dosing is listed here. Thankfully, this drug is with or without food. Most people tend to tolerate these drugs better with food, I can tell you that. If I think about class effects of PARP inhibitors, <clears throat> I think of the nausea and vomiting risk, I think of blood counts, fatigue, and then gastrointestinal, so like diarrhea that can happen. Most often over time, um, Patients will say, because again, this is a chronically dosed medication, the fatigue can become bothersome over time. And so often patients might require a dose reduction because of that fatigue, and that is A-OK. -okay. Um, these also can cause um, random elevations in serum creatinine. So you might see that over time. It's nothing, it's not a permanent change in serum creatinine, but something that you should hold and assess um, if that does occur. There are drug-drug interactions, so be considerate of that. We didn't really talk about the nausea risk. So these drugs, the nausea can be very significant right out of the gate, or it can be just something that waxes and just wanes over time. If it's out of the gate, most patients will require some sort of anti-nausea medication to be scheduled before their dosing, which, you know, that's another kind of Thing they need to remember in terms of taking a chronically dosed medication. So um, considering that for some patients. In addition, if any of these side effects become problemsome, dose reduction should occur. Okay, so immune checkpoint inhibitors and oral targeted therapies are really key treatment options for our solid tumor patient population. When we use them in combination, of course, it becomes a little bit more difficult to tease out their side effects. Um, be cognizant of any drug-drug interactions. So again, assessing the patient's medication list to make sure um, there's nothing that can interact. That's our part of our job here in clinic as a clinic pharmacist is making sure that there are no drug-drug interactions or <clears throat> making recommendations for what to do with those. We do have very beautiful, or we have access to very beautiful oral chemotherapy handouts. So if you are on UConnect and you search for oral chemotherapy, um, and at the bottom of the page, the first page that pops up, if you go to it, there will be oral chemotherapy handouts that you can access. This is what we utilize in clinic in terms of educating patients, but it kind of goes through the how to take things, potential drug-drug interactions, if there's food to avoid, safe handling considerations for the home. We really didn't talk about that, but that's also in those handouts, which is um, really nice for patients. It's like a one-stop shop for patients. Um, and then just Another highlight, please use us in clinic. Um, we're very, very friendly. So please reach out if you ever have any questions or concerns about honestly anything, but immune checkpoint inhibitors and um, oral therapies are definitely things that you know we kind of specialize here in clinic with. So with that, I am all done. <laughs>